All right. Woo. Let's uh, start finding our way forward to our seats so we can kick off this morning's worship service. want to welcome you to Ascent Bible Church and say, wow, we serve a mighty God. And we're here today not only to worship Him, but to expect great things from Him because He is more than equal to the task of blessing abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. And just thinking back to the end of last week's service, what a blessing it was to see the entire front of this area covered with people on their knees praying, seeking God, committing to walking more closely with Him. And I have to tell you, I, I think God has poured a special blessing upon this fellowship the people who make up this body of believers. And the fact that we're praying regularly, we're trusting, we're striving to walk more closely with Him. He's just going to do more and more and more in us, with us, and through us. And we should, uh, you, you will bless God if you expect amazingly great things from Him because he always wants to honor faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's pray. Father, we, we do bless you for your goodness to us, for your faithfulness, that you abundantly bless beyond all that we could ask or imagine, and that you are the great God, El El Yom, the mighty God above all gods. We present our hearts to you today, Lord, and ask you, fill them with joy. Fill them with excitement. Fill them with anticipation and trust and faith so that we can be testimonies to your goodness to all the world, especially to those that we interact with every day. Fill now this time of worship and praise. Speak to us by your word through the head pastor you've placed over us, the, the shepherd who shepherds us sacrificially. And be glorified today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome, church. We serve a God who is holy and who is worthy of our praise. And, you know, it, it's so easy these days to get so caught up and bogged down and overwhelmed by um, all the pain and suffering and confusion and chaos that this world has. And, and it, is, it is heavy, but God commands us to be joyful and to praise. In, in his word so often over and over, he says, consider it all joy, rejoice, rejoice. And so today we come saying, God, this is a day that you have made we will rejoice in it. We will praise you because you are good. And uh, so if you want to stand with us, that would be great. We're going to sing a song here that just says, we, we don't have the words to say who you are, God, but, but we stand in awe of you.
simplest of all love songs I want to bring to you. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I are difficult and hard, God. We have the joy of knowing that we have a God who sees our everything and desires to be right with us in those things, Lord God. And so, Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for how you love us, Lord. Thank you for how you are answering prayer. 
thank you that you never give up on us, Lord. Help us never to give up on you, Lord God. Father, in this next song, Lord God, as we worship you, Father, we want to just tell you that we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price you pay. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for unending grace. Thank you for.
we um, just pray that over ourselves, over uh, family members that we want to see saved, Father God. We declare that right now, Father God. And we thank you for the last verse. So good. It says, when the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. And you're always holding on, Father God, even in the darkest night. Thank you, Lord. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song. Let the King.
prayers when we cry out to you, Lord. Father, you are so good. And let us just shout it out to you, Lord. Father, this time is just so sweet. Father, I just pray that your kingdom be glorified with the words and with our with our deeds that follow. Father, I just pray that you would bless the truth that is spoken here today, Lord God, and that your spirit just pour out. And I just want to cry out to you, God, that you are almighty, and no matter what comes our way, that you will be there for us. Amen. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise the Lord. you, Lord. Thank you for this sweet, sweet time of worshiping you, God, and putting you into perspective, the right perspective of who you are on the throne of our lives, Lord yeah. God. We ask for your anointing over the teaching, God, that it just pierce our hearts and make us more like you. Amen. Jesus, we amen. love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeehaw! <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. What an amazing set really, I think, puts things in perspective for us as we prepare to consider what we're going to be delving into in this amazing letter 
that we've come to know is the letter to the Colossians that perhaps like no other letter that the Apostle Paul revealed to us in the New Testament um, really sheds a ton of light, a massive amount of light as it relates to his supremacy, his preeminence, who Jesus Christ is in our lives. And this is going to, the theme, this is going to be our theme moving forward. I just don't want us to lose sight of, so lose sight of that um, because moving forward as we consider some of these songs, um, they lift the name of Jesus. They remind us of his goodness, of his greatness, and he is the one to be honored and glorified. And I love this letter to the Colossians because this is the letter that Paul drives home um, to what we're at the church at Colossae or in its context, as we've already laid out in the last couple of weeks, the letter to the last day's church. And as I've been able to kind of bring some context these last two weeks, I just want us again to never forget or be mindful of the fact that I'm referring to this or we're subtitling this series, the letter to the, to the last day's church because of where it fits in, not just historically, but also within the structure of the Bible um, Charles handed out an outline a few weeks ago that shares with you kind of a chronological perspective of where these letters that we do find in our New Testament, how and where it is that they show up. And I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that the letter to the Colossians chronologically shows up kind of in the middle of where Paul began to publish his letters to both churches and individuals. But what's interesting, it shows up at the end of our New Testament, right before um, the letters to the Thessalonians. And if you know anything about the Thessalonican letters, it's in those letters that Paul is reminding the believers in Thessalonica, Greece, that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. That there is going to be an event called the rapture of the church, First Thessalonians chapter 4. And there is a the man of sin, the man of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2, that will be showing up, that will be playing out exactly everything that is revealed to us in the book of Revelation. So that's the theme of those last two books, which happen the first two letters that show up in the New Testament chronologically, but they show up at the end. Why? Because the next event on God's calendar, the for the believer, for the body of Christ, is the fact that he's coming back, that he's returning. So the one letter that shows up practically in our New Testament is none other than this letter to the Colossians, right before Paul begins to write about his return. Right as he's relating these truths about how the church ought to respond and the things that we ought to be focusing on right before his return. And this is what this letter to the Colossians is all about. This is going to be our focus and our theme and my hope and our prayer for me personally and also for Ascent Bible Church moving forward because as we shared with you last week, we are living in this crazy nutty world that we're referring to oftentimes as the twilight zone. And it's going to get more twilighty and more bizarre and crazier as time goes on. The issue and the charge and the challenge for me and for, me, for you and for myself is how are we going to respond? How are we going to deal with, with whatever it is that this world throws at us in the coming weeks and months and who knows, maybe, maybe even a couple of years? I pray that's not the case, but nonetheless, where and what will our focus be moving forward. So real quick, that was just kind of a historical contextual view of how and where this letter fits in. And there's a doctrinal application to scripture that I want us to consider and not lose sight of. And if you remember this from last week, we threw a map up on the screen and I want you to be mindful of the fact that historically, these seven churches that you see on this little map, often referred to as the seven churches of Asia Minor, which show up in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Historically, these were literal places. These were places on a map. And quote, coincidentally, 
Colossae just happened to be right next to this church mentioned in Revelation known as the church of Laodicea, right? So this is how and where this stuff plays out historically. But what's really fascinating about God's word, what always blows me away is his doctrinal application to scripture. In other words, what is it that God is revealing to us prophetically about these seven churches that he does in fact mention in the book of Revelation chapters two and three. And if you remember, we did a kind of a little detailed prophetic perspective of these seven churches that I don't want us to ever lose sight of moving forward because seven churches reveal to us exactly why this letter to the Colossians is pertinent and significant to the day and age in which we find ourselves so the doctr- doctrinal application is this. In those, seven, in those two chapters, chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, you find these seven churches mentioned. Yes, seven churches on a map. But prophetically, they're revealing to us, and the Spirit of God has revealed to us seven distinct periods of church history. So in the last 2,000 years, there have been seven distinct periods that God has dealt with the church and how he is defining, revealing to us of those seven periods. The first one in chapter number two, verse one, is the church at Ephesus. The church, by the way, that is explicitly mentioned both in Paul's writings, the letter to the Ephesians, as well as this literal place on a map. And if you remember, I shared with you how the church of Ephesus, which begins in 33 AD and roughly ends prophetically at 200 AD is the church that God is the church, the fully purposed church to establish, to lay the foundation for what he's got planned for the next 2000 years. Refers to it. And we know that from our study in Ephesians a few years ago, the fully purposed church. This is why the letter to the Ephesians is so significant Because it reveals to us our purpose like no other. As a matter of fact, I shared with you, I think, a couple weeks ago how oftentimes theologians find a lot of commonalities between Ephesus and the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians. And it's like, why are you doing this? Because in the letter to the Ephesians, God makes it about us, about our role, about our purpose. That's what the word Ephesian means, fully purposed. The letter to the Colossians, on the other hand, makes it all about Jesus. This is why I so appreciate these songs that we have been singing together, because they speak of his goodness, of his sovereignty, of his preeminence. And this letter is so prevalent. Why? Because that's the issue today. That is the one thing that the, the age that we find ourselves in his side of, of who Jesus Christ is going to be so key and so significant because it's going to reveal to us everything that we need to know about who he really is and who he needs to be in our lives. And if you look at the rest of those churches, the church that follows Ephesus in chapter number two is the church of Smyrna. That was the persecuted church. So from 220, from 200 AD to 325 AD, Man, the church was being persecuted severely. This is where you find in history near casting believers uh, before the lions in the Colosseum and lighting them and tarring them and, and lighting them up as torches to light up the streets of Rome. But you know what happened during that period, which is mind blowing? And this is why we ought not fear whatever this world is going to throw at us. The church literally blew up, man, it exploded. So this Roman emperor by the name of Constantine who saw a vision of the cross and thought in his mind, man, if I can't beat him, I might as well join them, (laughs) begins another church period from 325 to 500 AD known as the Pergamus period. And that word Pergamus means much marriage. And that's really where the world married the church, frankly. This is where the Roman church as we know it today is born. And it went from being a pagan religious system to now a papal religious system. 
And lo and behold, Constantine is technically and literally the first pope, not Peter. Peter was never a pope. Peter would have never wanted to be a pope. So from 500 AD to the 1000 AD, the fourth period shows up, and that is the church of Thyatira, the medieval church, the church of the dark ages. This is when the Freemasons show up, and they began to build those massive cathedrals all over Europe to honor themselves and not the God of the Bible. Darkest period in all of church history. History called is the Middle Ages, right? You know the word of God reveals that's the dark ages. And as God is moving characteristically seven church periods, the fifth period that shows up in Revelation chapter number three now is the church of This is where this is where you find the Protestant movement playing out. And you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings or offend any of you, but that's okay if I do. You and I, us Bible believers, we have never in the history of the body of Christ, the history of the church, been referred to as Protestants. Those are those denominations. Bible believers have always been in God's plan and God's purpose through all the dark times, through all the crazy times. So if you want to refer yourself or call yourself a Protestant, that's on you. That's okay. You know what I am? A Bible-believing, God-loving, Bible-loving believer Christian. They've always been there. Basically, um, what's the word about uh, the radar thing? Flying below the radar. Groups like the Huguenots, the Albigensians, they've been there being persecuted, not just by the Roman church, but also a lot of the Protestant churches as well. History. But God used that Reformation period to open the door to the gospel. And the greatest period in church history is finally awakened in 1600 AD that carries us into 1900, the Philadelphia Church Age. Anybody know what the word Philadelphia means? Brotherly love, man. 75%, folks, mark this, three quarters of the planet knew Jesus Christ as Savior during the Philadelphia Church Age. That was the age and the era in which this nation was born. It was founded during the Philadelphian church age, and my glory, did the Lord use this nation and this country for his glory. As missionaries were sent all over this planet, both from England and from America. And then the last church age shows up. From 1900 to the rapture of the church, the Laodicean church. And I shared with you last week when we were looking at that, that sermon on the tale of two, it's really a tale of two churches. The Laodicean church, the lukewarm, not cold, not hot, this poor, fine, wretched church age that has lost sight of who Jesus Christ is has locked him out of the church. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it's three verses later, the rapture happens. But in Revelation verse 20, you find this very sad situation where Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking and asking if somebody would just open this door, I will sup with him and he with me. Now here's what's fascinating. I shared with you this thought Last week, take your Bibles and turn with me to Colossians 4. And I want you to understand now, not just geographically why God placed Colossae where he did next to Laodicea, what it represents prophetically or doctrinally. And as Paul is bringing this amazing letter, the letter to the Colossians to a close, 
And there's only four chapters, as you'll see. It might take us a couple of years to get through four chapters, and that's okay, right? Because today, well, that's kind of how we roll here. We just let the Word of God lead us and direct us, and we're going to do a verse-by-verse, expositorily approach to this letter, this amazing letter, that will shed so much light on what our perspective should be in terms of ourselves. And here's the truth behind this story. Look at verse number 15 of chapter 4. This is how the letter to the Colossians ends. Remember this from last week? Colossae and Laodicea. They were sister cities. Albuquerque, Rio Rancho. Separated by a river. Geographically, the Lyons River. The trade route happened to go to look through Laodicea, and this is why it was a wealthy, prominent place historically. And those folks on the east side of the river were so focused on their wealth and their prosperity that they lost sight of who God is, hence their lukewarmness, their blindness, their wretchedness, their misery. And all those characteristics that you find in the book of Revelation chapters. Three verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. And then you get to this, these last couple here in Colossians, and it says, and all right, Epaphras, all right, church at Colossae, when you read this letter of the Colossians, look what he says Salute the brethren which are where? We're in Laodicea. Historically, it's a place on the map. Prophetically, it's the age in which we find ourselves in. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church in his house. Praise God, there was a church even in Laodicea, huh? And then he said, when this epistle is read among you, when this letter is read, this letter that we're going to be unpacking over the next several weeks and months, he says, when this letter, this Colossians is read among you, he says, cease that it, uh, cause it that it also be read in the church of the Laodiceans. So the message that we, Ascent Bible Church, is to take to this world, the Laodicean age in which we all find ourselves in, is contained in these four chapters that we're going to be spending time with together in the coming weeks and months. The ladies and likewise read, read the epistle, this epistle. Hence, the subtitle of our series, The Letter to the Last Day's Church. Folks, we are there. I don't know what you believe, I don't know what you think about where you're living or how you're living, but we are. So if that's going to prepare us, that is going to equip us, that is going to reveal to us where our focus, where our priorities, what we should be doing. It was the letter to the Colossians. The word let us see it. Didn't prove the Bible true. The word Laodicea means the rights of the people or the people's rights. Remember that from last week? Tell me we aren't there. Tell me that's not the focus and the agenda of this planet, of this world, is your feelings, my feelings. It's all about me. No, it's not. It should be all about Him, it is what this whole thing should be about. This is why these songs that we're singing matter because they should be about him. And the word or the name Colossi, as the name implies, colossal, simply means huge. The message to the latency and age in which we find ourselves is huge, it's massive. It matters. So excited. 
about what the Lord will reveal to us in the coming weeks and months. This is our outline for today. We're going to be looking at the challenge of this unique church, and we build our sermon a, a unique church for uncertain times. My hope and my prayer is that we Bible Church become that unique church that we're not laid to see in our mindset and our mentality, but we're on this side of the river, focusing and realizing and embracing all that Paul's going to reveal to us in the text. And then we're going to look at the culture of this unique church in verse number two. We're only going to look at two verses this morning, so bear with me. These two verses are loaded with so much truth, and this is also his salutation. This is his greeting to the church at Colossae. And as he's revealing this, these thoughts, or in his greeting, he's parting to us so many profound truths about how and where we should be and what our focus should be and what the church consists of, frankly. And then the third principle that we'll look at is the charge that he gives to this unique church. A very interesting challenge that everybody in the Should I turn this off? I'll try to do this because you guys already can tell that I use my hands a lot when I speak. <laughs> I think uh, I had an Italian in my family way back in the day somewhere. Not sure. Um, but um, So take your Bibles and turn with me to this amazing letter to the Colossians here in chapter number one. I'm going to just read a couple of verses and then we're going to look and unpack these verses. It says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here's an interesting phrase, a fascinating phrase that I don't want us to lose sight of, by the will of God. I want us this morning as we start looking at this passage, what the will of God actually means biblically. We're going to talk about how it applies, the God's will applies the same. It's the same for every believer for if, you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've accepted him as your savior, God's will for your life is the same as it is for mine. Now, his plan for yours is different than mine, but his will is the same. And we'll see some things out of some other passages that reveal to us that truth. So he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, and in verse 2, he says, to the saints and to the brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. He mentions how many groups of people in that part of the verse? Two. The saints and the faithful brethren. Interesting little contrast. Goes on, he says, in the rest of the verse, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. And don't lose the last part of the verse, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at some things in this passage, I pray, that will shed some significant light about the uniqueness of this church, the church at Colossae versus the church across the river, Laodicea. And what made this church so unique and so significant and so profound that God in his plan and in his infinite wisdom and where he placed it in our Bible, he places it right before the two letters that deal with the second coming of Christ. This letter is for us, man. This letter is written to you and to me. And as we start looking and unpacking these verses, you're going to be blown away about Paul's focus, about who and how he reminds us about the significance of who Jesus Christ 
and what he needs to be to the church of the last days like never before. Those of you that have already been reading ahead, maybe you've picked up a, a commentary or maybe learned, maybe gone online and listened to some other preacher on this letter to the Colossians. You know that the term preeminence is always used in the first chapter in revealing to us God's sovereignty. Thank you, Pastor Mike Cadetta, for Wednesday night, the last couple worship Wednesdays where we've been focusing on the sovereignty of God. Because the entire first chapter reveals to us and speaks to us about who God is, about who Jesus Christ is and who he needs to be in our lives. And this is the thing that Paul drives home in this letter in reminding the Colossian believers as he tells them to read this letter across the river to the Laodiceans, remind them of who Jesus is. That word preeminence is a $20,000 theological word, which simply means supremacy, which simply means that God deserves all of the glory, that he is the one to be glorified, that he is the one to be honored, and he is the reason why we live. And thank you for the songs this morning because those songs remind us of his goodness and his greatness and his love towards us. That's the theme of this letter to the Colossians. That is the awesomeness or the hugeness of this message. Those of you that were here on Wednesday night for prayer time, as Pastor Mike was continuing on his little series in the Lord's Prayer, he reminded us and he went back and reminded us and revealed to us the importance of the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is sitting on the throne, that in spite of what we see going on in this crazy nutcracker world that we're all finding ourselves in, that he is sovereign, that he is sovereign, that everything that is playing out is intended and designed exactly like his word reveals to us. So isn't that comforting? No reason to be freaking out with all the craziness and nuttiness in this thing called the twilight zone. He's in control. That's what his sovereignty speaks of. That's what he speaks to. So whatever it is that we're going through, whatever it is that we're struggling with, the fear, the anxiety, the trepidation, all those things that are being used by the world, the flesh, and the devil to keep you from really honoring him and focusing on him are nothing more than just that, distractions to keep you and me from the only thing that matters, and that's him. That's his message. And I don't have to tell you, but the most significant issue today in the Laodicean age, in this dark age that we find ourselves living in, across the river, is the issue of the sovereignty of God. Right? Did you guys catch what he said on Wednesday night? When, and I'm with him on this one, man, Nothing annoys me or bugs me more when these athletes get up there and refer to Jesus as the man upstairs. That's where we're at. Or we're all good about talking about God, right? And I'm cool with referring to God and God as being my father and a sovereign God. But you know what people hate and will refuse to do? Even quote Christians or followers of Jesus? to use the very name of Jesus. We'll talk about God. It's okay to talk about God because in this dark latest scene age that we all find ourselves in, your God could be anything you want it to be, including yourself. But biblically, there's only one God, and that God is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is driving home. You know, it even breaks my heart as you consider this, these two verses that we just read. Look what it says in verse 2 as he's introducing this letter to the Colossians. Paul says, this letter's to the saints and to the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. He says, grace be unto you and peace 
from God our Father, and who else? Everybody see that? And the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that is burdensome and painful to me, if you look at all the modern translations today, well, it'll read almost exactly to, as you see it on the screen, except for the last part of that verse where it says, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's even been left out. So we wonder why the culture thinks and believes and minimizes who the Lord Jesus Christ is when he's left out of the actual text. And we wonder why we're wondering who Jesus Christ is and we're trying to reach an entire generation of young people who have no concept and no clue. 65% of professing Christians in this latency and church age that we all find ourselves in, mind you, six, this is a, the survey from George Barna, 65%, between 65 and 70% believe that there's more ways to God than through Jesus Christ. That's where we're at. That's our challenge. That's our issue. That's our dilemma. And why is that? Because Jesus isn't in our vernacular anymore. We spiritualize everything. This is why I love his word. His word sheds so much light on his goodness, his love, but more importantly and more significantly is we're going to see and we're going to unpack these verses in the letter to the Colossians, his preeminence, his supremacy. That is the one truth, the one significant that each and every one of us, I pray, will embrace like never before because, folks, he is not the man upstairs. He is the God that saved you. He is the God that shed his blood on a cross for you. And he is the God that loves you. Paul, driving this home. So what's the challenge for us as believers you know why we're in such a dark place or living in a dark time? Even among the church, and I shared with you some crazy notions last week. Remember, I shared with you what Augusta has a friend back in D.C. Who was, who, was trying to, who was trying to, as they were having a discussion, she was trying to reveal to her, share with her how, how do you know that Jesus was actually born from the virgin birth? Remember, we talked, we laid that whole thing out. The Word of God says that he was born of a virgin. It's the Bible that reveals to us his deity and how, the God, how God chose to bring him about, how to give him a, a human form and a human body. Why? So that he could die on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. To become that sacrifice. And that woman had the audacity to ask her, how do you know he wasn't raped? Or she was, that Mary wasn't raped. And that's how Jesus came about. Literally, that's out there. And when she asked that question in Bible study, I said, you know what? That's not news to me. I heard that about two years ago. A woman by the name of Sarah Wood, a pastor, mind you, in the United Church of Christ, came up with that notion. That's where we're at. And I shared with you that just two weeks ago, Harvard as they were getting ready for the new college year, the new school year, hired, check this out, as the head of all the chaplains at Harvard University, an atheist to lead the chaplaincy. <laughs> Welcome to the Twilight Zone. You know why that is? We've removed Jesus from his place, from his throne, from where he deserves to be acknowledged and praised and worshipped. So you get to the next part of the verse where Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, he drives home the importance of God's will to the believer, to the church. 
That's our challenge. So if Jesus isn't present in the culture, how will you ever know what God's will for your life is? Because his will for your life and for my life is the same. And it's revealed, for those of you that may not know this, and our seventh lesson in discipleship is the lesson on the will of God. You know what God's will for your life is and for my life? To be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to be. That's what you're called to do. In Romans chapter number 8, verse 27, Paul speaks about God's will and how the Spirit of God has indwelled us to be there to reveal to us, to, to equip us, to be able to realize His will for our lives, interceding on our behalf. And then you get to the very next verse, the 28th verse, and Paul begins to talk about how the things that we go through in life, both good and bad, are part of life. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His what? What's his purpose? To make you like Jesus. I appreciate somebody's prayer this morning. I forget who it was. Lord, thank you for the trials and the tribulations in life. That's the good and the bad. Because if you think that you're going to be conformed into his image or transformed by osmosis, just because you think that's the way to go and Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul because now my life is nothing more than me, Tiny Tim song, tiptoeing through the tulips. You are sadly mistaken, man. Because the only way to be conformed to his image is to allow him to transform us through the trials and the tribulations in this life. That's what he's driving home in this verse. Now look at verse 29. This is an amazing verse. For whom also he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. This verse has nothing to do with salvation. Calvinists cannot claim this. You know why? Because the Bible's going to reveal to you exactly what he predestinated. Here's what God predestinated. To conform us into the image of his son. That's what God predetermined before the world ever, ever began. Was to make his followers. To make you and me like Jesus. That's how he's glorified. That's God's will for your life. That's God's will for my life. It's not rocket science. All you have to do is take God's word for what it reveals and what it says about why he created you. You were put on this planet for his glory. You were created by him and for him. And until we realize that and we embrace that, this life this world will never, ever make sense, so don't let this world define you. Let him define you. And God's will for your life and for my life is to simply become like Jesus. That ain't an easy thing to do, man. I will be the first thing to tell you. That's the challenge. That's what God is trying to reveal to these folks in Colossae. This is why over and over and over in this book, you're going to find two phrases, two words that reveal to us the significance of this truth. You're going to see the word fulfill and the word complete. What's interesting, it's the same word translated for fulfill and to complete. You know what God wants to do before you're raptured out of here? To complete you. So when Paul was talking to Timothy about the word of God being everything that we need to equip us, remember 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for truth or for doctrine, for reproof or for correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God and the woman of God may be perfect. That doesn't mean sinless. You know what that means? Mature, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God wants you and me to become like Jesus. Unfortunately, we'll never realize it this side of eternity. Philippians 1.6. Be confident of this one thing, Paul says, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. Until that rapture happens, until you get your glorified body, everybody in this room is a stinking work in progress. 
you are. The key is to let him continue to chip away. So the trials and the struggles, the things that we're going to go through in this life, in this journey, as we keep our eyes locked on him, in spite of what this world does to you and what it does to itself, is don't lose sight of why you are here. And that is to glorify him as he conforms you, as he transforms you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, he says. He goes on, he says in verse 2, be, but be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. That doesn't mean he doesn't want to turn you into a little toy. He doesn't want you to be a little transformer. He wants you to be what? Be transformed. How? Into his image. By the will of God. This is why this is such a unique letter. He drives home with these solid, sound Colossian believers, this massive message about God's will for our lives. In Colossians 1.9, you find the word fulfill. You find these words, for this cause we also, since the day that we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That word filled is the same word to fulfill, to complete. He desiring that for you and for me in this journey. And if we don't think that we're going to go through some trial and some tribulation, we are sadly mistaken. We are deceiving ourselves. As Paul said to Timothy, those that will live godly, godlike, Christ-like, those that will live godly in Christ Jesus will what? will suffer persecution. Not maybe, not might. Will. Some of us knuckleheads, we bring it on ourselves. <laughs> but could you imagine how whatever it is that we're going to end up going through, that at the end of the day, he's making you more like him. So that in spite of what we go through, just like Corey Ten Boom this amazing woman that went through a Nazi concentration camp and survived it, at the end of her life, she said these words, if we focus on the world, you'll be distressed. If you focus in yourself, you'll be depressed. But if you focus on Jesus, you'll be at rest. I want to be like that woman. This is what God is revealing to these folks in this amazing letter, this next point, this is the culture of this unique church. It was a very unique church. Could you bring that point up, Dre? Thank you. Oops, sorry. The culture of this church. Look at Colossians 1 and 2 with me again. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. And look who he writes to. He's writing to the saints, and catch this, folks, and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are where? Not at Laodicea, but they were at Colossae, across the river. They got it. This is the only church out of the seven churches that Paul writes to. Church of Rome, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, even the Thessalonians, where you find another group of people mentioned in the text. You know who they are? the faithful brethren. In all, his others, in all his other letters, he's referring to the saints. We, in this day and age in which we find ourselves because we've let the Roman system define terms for us, we don't even know what, the, what, what saints means in the Bible. To that system, it's a bunch of old dead people that haven't been around and they go through a series of tests and how many miracles that they perform and check mark them, and then they all vote to see who gets to be a saint. Well, guess who gets to be a saint in God's plan? Anybody who accepts him as his savior. That includes you. I bet you never thought you'd be called a saint. Some of you, I'm not so sure. Let me show you the biblical definition for for saint in the Bible. Again, what does the Bible say? 
Who cares about what John Romero thinks or says about what a saint is? Who cares what Rome thinks about what a saint is? What, is, what do the scriptures say about sainthood? Look at verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians 1. Under the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be what? Called to be saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. There it is. You know what a biblical saint is? Anybody who's called on the name of Jesus. And now the word saint typically, literally means, not typically, literally means this. One who is set apart for a purpose. That's all it means. So that, yes, that includes you. Yes, that involves you. That involves me. God has a purpose for us. And you know how he's going to sanctify us? You know how we're going to be conformed to his image? All things work together for good. All things work together for good, the good and the bad. And the ugly, for you Clint Eastwood fans. To those that love God and are called according to his purpose. How many of you in this room love God? Praise God. Live for his glory. So you know what the whole thing about sanctification is? You know what he's driving home? You know another word for sanctification? This is a hard one for us. Holiness. That doesn't mean that you have to do something. You don't have to become something. You know what the goal here is? Transformation. And you know how he's going to transform you? You know how he's going to transform me? By the renewing of our mind. How it is that we think about who he is and what he did for you. And all of a sudden, that begins to just happen naturally. You don't have to force the issue. You don't have to think that you've got to do these seven things, perform, do seven sacraments, or, or do a, a walk up to Chimayo every year to somehow think that that's going to transform you or, or sanctify you. No. Sanctification simply means that you and I are becoming more and more like Christ each and every day. That you become more like Jesus tomorrow than you were today and more today than you were yesterday. That's his plan. That's his desire for us. That's what it means to be a saint. And then he mentions this second group, right? It's the only church out of the seven churches. Go back and read all the salutations to the church in Rome, Corinth, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, even Thessalonians. The only people group, the only church mentioned in the New Testament that has this other group is the church at Colossae. And they're referred to as the faithful brethren. A lot of saints in the church. I'm not talking statues about dead people. I'm talking about church saints in this room, and I praise God for that. But you know what God's desire for you is, seriously? Is to become that faithful brethren that faithful brother and sister in Christ. Man, you're going to need your faith like never before as we press on. As things continue to play out the way they're playing out, you are going to be need your faith sharper than it's ever been. And that's on you. That's on me. I can't make you faithful. That's on you. I'm not and will never be your village priest. My goal when I'm discipling people is simply to do what? Point them to Jesus. He will transform us. He will reveal to us. He is the sovereign one. He is the one that sits on the throne. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you find the process that God uses to do that. He says in verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I love these two verses. This is the theme verse. Verse number two is the theme verse for our discipleship ministry in our church. And you know what Paul says in this, in this second verse to Timothy, this young man that he discipled? All right, Timothy, the things that you've heard of me, what are those things? Who Jesus Christ is, his sovereignty, his preeminence, what he did on the cross for us, salvation, the fact that you are eternally his, the purpose for baptism, what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, prayer? 
Those are all truths, foundational truths that we use in our church to invest in someone. And Paul says, those things, I want you, Timothy, to commit to who? To just anybody? Commit to the lost world? No, what does he tell you to do? Commitment, commit them to faithful men and women. People that want to take this whole thing to another level. And what is their role then? What is the purpose and the role of that faithful person? That person that Paul tells Timothy to be committed to. What should they be doing? Did you see that? To teach others also. So you may be sitting out there to this, this morning thinking, hey, John, it's your job to teach me to to teach us, to teach this church. And you know what? I totally embrace that role. I understand what Ephesians 4.11 says about my role and my responsibility in that area. I get it. But we too have a responsibility to teach others also about the things of God. Why is this age so dark? Why is it late as sin? At some point, the church, we failed in teaching our youth, our children, who Jesus Christ is. And now we have a whole generation, 65, 70% of our culture or professing Christians that say, hey, man, you want to believe in Buddha? Hey, he'll get you there. Muhammad will get you there. So everything that Jesus said about his plan, his purpose, and of himself, like John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now that's a lie. That's a lie in the culture's eyes. There's the charge. So what's the plan or what's the purpose here? You know what? We have a tool. We have a way to invest these things in you so that you could in turn invest them in somebody else. That's why he left you here when he saved you not just to take up another chair in a church. That's why I'm so grateful. I'm going to talk next week about the next five verses in this passage. Paul's grateful heart to a generous people. Man, I can't tell you how incredible you are. We have our staff meeting, and we talk about some of the things that are going on around here in this small little fellowship. It's amazing what God is doing and how he's using you. For his glory. You know what it says to me? You get it. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so honored to be the pastor of this church. And who and how it is that he's using to work. This is what we're called to be. This is what we're called to do. And 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, is nothing more than four rungs in a ladder. Where you and I should be progressing, if you will going from just being another or any other person at church, others also, to becoming a faithful follower of Jesus who then becomes a Timothy to a Paul in your life. And you know what would really be cool? We got a literal Paul right here. <laughs> to be a Paul and have a Paul in Timothy's life. I'm looking at Tim and Christine over here and Tim says, yep. You know why? Because Paul is discipling Tim and Christine. This is what it's about. And if we're doing this right, someday they will be discipling somebody else and revealing and sharing and imparting what God has done in their life and how God has transformed them. The only condition we will have as a church is he cannot wear that jersey. <laughs> That's the only one. That's the only, ch it's the only issue. But we're praying for you, brother. We will continue to pray. And the last thing that Paul says to this church, this amazing church that I hope ascent will become, or ascent is, he says this to them. All right, child guys. And I'm going to close with this. Grace be unto you and peace. From God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be and peace. When we were kicking off our faith series, right, Larry, remember that? I shared with everybody how 
I don't want us to ever lose sight of the fact, church, that his grace abounds. It really does. Not only does his grace save you, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but his grace is also and will also sustain you. It's what's going to get you through this crazy life. And just like there's oxygen in this room right now, that oxygen is worthless if there isn't somebody to take it all in. That's called your breath. That's incumbent on you. So God's grace is just like oxygen. It's out there. It's ready, and it's, it's ready for the taking. But it's your faith and my faith that is the conduit to tap into that grace. And that conduit, that faith pipe could be this big or it could be this big or non-existent at all. But your faith and my faith is going to be the key in tapping into his grace that is going to get you through the crazy world and the crazy times that we find ourselves in. And this is why Paul says to these guys, you're going to need God's grace moving forward, guys. You're going to need his grace like never before. I often in this church turn that word grace into an acronym. It still applies. Grace is nothing more than God's riches at Christ's expense. He gave it all so that we could live a life that we can fulfill and complete everything that he says to these guys in this letter. Because of God's grace, it is doable. That his grace, as Paul prayed to Jesus in 2 Corinthians 12, as he's going through this difficult time and begging Jesus to remove this, this pain, this suffering that he was going through. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that. You know why, Paul? Because in your weakness, you are made what? You're made strong. I'm transforming you, dude. Don't you get it? You're being conformed into my image. And then he says to him in verse 12, Paul, brother Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here to tell you, man, his grace is sufficient. His grace is all you need. His grace is anything any of us need. And grace, if you look at all of Paul's letters, all these greetings, all these salutations, grace always precedes peace. You struggling with some anxiety this morning? Not sure about what tomorrow brings? You're what ifing your life away? What if? What if the rapture happened tonight? You wouldn't have to worry about next week or even tomorrow. Struggling with those worrisome thoughts, those anxious thoughts. You know what God's offering you as you tap into his grace through the conduit of faith. He's going to grant you peace. 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 Peace, brother. Peace. Chaotic times. Dark times. Let me share with you a quick thought about this peace thing real quick. We talked about this, I think, at Christmas time a couple years ago, and then we looked at it in the book of Joshua even. But those of you that have been to Israel or you know some Jewish guy perhaps, I don't know, but whenever you meet and you greet a Jewish person, what's the first words out of their mouth? Shalom. What's the last things out of their mouth as you're getting ready to leave? Shalom. When they really want to cut you off, Larry, what's the word? Shalom, shalom. <laughs> All right, it's time to end the convo right now. Move on, dude. Well, you know what that word shalom means? It means peace. These are the Hebrew letters, the Hebrew of the Hebrew alphabet that make up the word shalom. Those of you that know anything about Asiatic languages, you know that they go and they read right to left, unlike the Western world where we go left to right. But the first Hebrew letter is the letter shin. The second one, lamed. Don't jump ahead yet. The next one is Vav, and the next one and the last one is Mem. These are the Hebrew letters that make up the Hebrew word peace or shalom. Now, this is what those letters literally mean. Check this out. The first letter means to destroy. It means to destroy. The second one 
authority. Destroy the authority. The third one looks like a little tent stake, a little tent pig, something that attaches. The third letter means attached, and the fourth one means chaos. You know what peace will do in your life? Destroy the authority attached to chaos. That's what God wants to realize in your life. That's what he wants us to embrace. He wants to destroy the darkness, all that the thief does in your life to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, tap into my grace and you'll experience my peace. A peace that destroys the authority attached to what? Chaos. And you know where that chaos happens in a lot of our lives? Turn in your Bibles to, and we're going to close with this, Philippians chapter 4. I promise we're closing with this. Chapter 4, verse number 6, he says, Be careful for nothing. Quit worrying. Why are you so focused? Why are, she, why are you worrying? Why are you what ifing your life away? He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything. What's everything? Anybody have any clue what that means in the Greek? Everything. <laughs> But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In other words, you let him know what's going on in your life in spite of how insignificant you might think it is. Let him know what's happening, man. Let him know what's on. The only thing, as we talked last week, the only thing that God wants and desires from you is what? Is you. Is fellowship, is intimacy. To, be, to let your prayers and your supplications be made on them. And then you thank him, thank him. A prayer this morning, man, I heard so many prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, him, for everything. I believe it's 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 23 says this. In everything, not for, but in everything, including your circumstances, in everything give thanks. For this is, catch his folk, folks, for this is the will of, in everything give thanks through Christ Jesus, he says, for this is, listen to this, for this is the will of God concerning you. You know where God transforms us? In our thanksgiving in spite of what we're going through. That's a hard one to do for us, isn't it? Man, Lord, thank you for that crisis. Thank you for that furnace of affliction. David got it, didn't he? Remember the 119th Psalm, verse 71? It is good, David said, for me to be afflicted. What is he, some kind of a masochist it is good he says for me to be afflicted why that i lord might learn thy statutes man lord it gets me to in your word the issue is when we go through that crisis when we go through whatever it is that we're going through where do we turn if you get to that fork in the road there's that pot pharmacy there to cure your little ailment you're a little emotional for a little while or you can turn to him and he will heal you man why because he's the great physician that's who he is he paul goes on he says in verse number number six number seven he says and the peace and here's the promise as we do that as we let our request be made known on again look what happens next and the peace of god which passeth all understanding you won't even understand it i won't even get it will keep your your hearts and your minds, who you are intellectually, what goes on in your head, and what's going on in your heart, who you are emotionally. What does the word keep mean? Anybody know? He wants to protect your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Verse number eight, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what does he tell you and me to do? Think on these things. See where the issue is? It's in your head. It's in your mind. You're more concerned about what they're doing in Washington than focusing and thinking about the things that God wants you to focus on. You know what I call that? And I don't have to tell you because that place is a sewer. It's called stinking thinking. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, man. He's sovereign on his throne. And he's to be glorified. And he says to you and to me, focus and think on these things. And look at what the outcome is. Verse 9. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, he tells you to do what? 
to do it. So you go from just thinking about it to just acting it out, and that's being an example and a light to a lost and dying world. He says, do it. And the God of peace will wait till you get raptured. Is that what it says? And the God of peace, what? Shall be with you. Jesus being true to his promise from the very beginning. As Joshua was heading into the promised land with uncertain things, having no clue, no idea what was going to play out, he says, don't worry, dude, I got your back. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Just put that in the bank. He will be what? With you. Did you see what he just called himself? Did you see the title that Jesus get, just gave himself? The God of what? The God of peace. The God of peace. I'm going to leave you with this final thought. As the disciples were, I promise, as the disciples were getting ready to leave Jesus, or Jesus was preparing to leave the disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, after revealing to them all this grace stuff, the fact that he was going to go to the cross, the fact that he was going to, to die for their sins and but don't worry, dudes, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit, who's the comforter. All these things are going to play out. All these things are going to happen. And then he gets to the very last part of the Last Supper, and the last words out of his mouth are found in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, and verse number 33. He says, these things, Jesus says, what things? Everything that he just said from chapter 13 till the end of this chapter. He says, these things I have spoken unto you that ye might have peace destroy the authority attached to chaos all these things i've said unto you that ye might have peace why do we need peace for in the world in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer for i jesus said and this is why he's sovereign this is why he's where he's at. For I have overcome the world. That's our Lord. His preeminence. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its goodness, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, your peace. But Lord, above all else, I am just thankful and grateful for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing in Ascent Bible Church. Continue to open our hearts and our minds to your word as we continue to embrace the truths and the principles of this amazing, this huge letter that is so applicable to us in the day and age in which we find ourselves. Use us this week, Lord. Use us today. Use us, Lord, for the rest of our lives for your glory. And Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. book in the sight of all the people for he was above all the people and when he opened it all the people stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord the great God and all the people answered all the people answered yeah. amen amen with lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground amen
to Ascent Bible Church. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, please fill out one of the cards that you find on the clip to the backs of several of the seats here. Drop it in the offering box in the center of the uh, sanctuary. And if we have any first-time visitors, we have a gift for you. We would like to bless you with a book of Bible promises. Inside that book, you will also find a blue card which uh, gives you an opportunity to give us your contact information. Um, we don't usually call out new visitors or new people, but today we kind of have a, a special day going. Um, you may know that last week a family from Nigeria joined us for the first time, the Abba Nifi family. And we want to welcome them, but especially Chigozia whose birthday is today. And uh, <laughs> normally we print the birthdays, normally we print the birthdays in the monthly communique, but since it was already out last week when they joined us, we didn't get a chance to put his name in. So uh, he, great guy, prayed with us this morning, and uh, we're very happy to have the Abanifi family with us. If you get a chance, welcome them personally, get to know them and their three kids. Next. Um, last week I told you you had until Friday to sign up for the women's conference, and we just extended that until Tuesday because we're having our next uh, volunteer meeting on Tuesday, those of you who are volunteers, and especially the leaders of each of the uh, areas of the conference. So please join us on Tuesday for that. But you... You ladies who haven't signed up yet have a couple days left that you can sign up. We need to know that you're coming so that we can plan meals and gift bags, etc. So just go to our website, ascentbible.church, click in the Women's Conference heading up near the top right, and it'll take you right to the registration. We have um, tuition available if you can't afford to be there because we know things are tight with people having job issues, et cetera, with COVID. So don't be shy about coming and asking for help. Next Sunday, John will be speaking on a grateful heart.
for a gracious people and really digging into the beauty of Paul's heart for the saints in Colossae. Bible study Q&A resumes this week. Last week, as John mentioned, we had our prayer and praise Wednesday night, but we're back on. So if you have any questions, you can either text them to John on his number. You'll find it on the back of the uh, communique or send them by email to Bible study at ascentbible.church. The communique for September is in the lobby. Avail yourself of that. I think that's a, a word that thrills some people. So uh, take advantage of the fact that we tell you what's going on around here. Construction continues. Um, the electricians did a lot of work this week and left the place pretty clean after it. You may also notice that some of our windows are closed in. We're actually putting in insulation so that there's less echo from the sound system. And we're working on the sound system to improve that continually as well as the video system. So just be careful around the construction areas and thank you for your patience. Um, again, welcome for being here. I just have to say, the Lord is picking up steam in this fellowship and you don't want to miss the train as it leaves the station. So just continue to uh, get to know each other, study God's word, pray to the Lord who is everything to us, and be blessed this week. Join us in the room next door for uh, snacks and, and fellowship after the service. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week, Lord willing.